they operated in the shadows, following top secret orders to preserve the might of their empires. The mysteries of history's special agents stretches back thousands of years. But now, the case files on history's real James Bonds are being reopened. The ninja assassins that blew their enemies away. The secret agent who wore the world's first life jacket to save Rome from burning. The Italian genius who wrote secret messages on the inside of eggs. And the elite spy communication systems that supported history's greatest empires. The surprising results will reveal a profound insight into the world of the ancient secret agent, one that is still true of the men and women who serve in the intelligence community today. Blowing the whistle on the hidden world of the secret agent is our ancient discovery. The secret agent operates alone, against the odds, deep behind enemy lines. Sometimes assassin, sometimes saboteur, always intelligence gathering. They are a vital part of the military machine today, and the same was true in the ancient world. The most dangerous secret agent was trained to kill, silently, almost invisibly. In the 15th century, History's most mysterious assassins, the ninja, struck fear into the nation of Japan. The dark arts of the ninja are shrouded in secrecy, even today. Ninja history is uh, surrounded in secrecy and, and mystery because the history of the samurai and, and Japanese history was, was written by the samurai. Mark Moore is a modern day ninja practitioner. He has been studying ninjutsu for over 25 years and has mastered all the skills of a ninja. The ninja's most basic combat technique was unarmed jujitsu, the art of softness. A martial art that involves holds and throws, pinning an enemy to the ground. The art also trained the ninja in how to break out of enemy holds, but nothing was off limits. Jujitsu trained the ninja in gouging, striking, kicking, and incredibly, even biting an attacker. However, they also used simple and deadly blades. One of the most common was the shuriken. Many of them were just simple bits of metal bashed out into any sort of shapes that could be thrown. The result is a cheap but deadly blade. There's various ways of using a shuriken. Uh, throwing it at a target, or you can use it close quarters to rip and to tear or to lever things apart. But there is a surprising and little known aspect to ninja weapons. They adapted their shuriken blades to create bombs. Evidence comes from an ancient Japanese text known as the Bansen Shukai. A lot of the information comes from Bansen Shukai. The Bansen Shukai is an ancient Japanese text written in 1676. It is one of the first known written records of ninja activities and practices. It details uh, the types of implements that were used, uh, techniques, and ninja strategies. The book is a set of blueprints that reveal the secrets of how to turn the shuriken into a bomb. Richard Windley has been studying these ancient texts and has recreated the ancient ninja attack device. What they did with these devices um, was to make them into what we would now call a, a, a stun grenade. A shuriken bomb is effectively a smoke bomb, a hand-thrown device with black powder and a fuse. This would hurtle into a room, maybe, or a whole volley of these things hurtle into a room, and then suddenly they'd explode. The device is simple, yet devastatingly effective. It involves strapping two equally weighted hemispheres full of black powder onto the shuriken. This allows the shuriken to be thrown into an attack without upsetting the balance and aerodynamics of the projectile. The throwing technique could be exactly the same as on a normal shuriken, but the results totally different. There'd be quite a loud bang, which can sort of obviously affect the ears. The flash could disorient people. It could also give them temporary flash blindness for a few seconds, which may be enough 
for the assailants to get in and do whatever damage they were trying to do. With the strategic use of small amounts of black powder, the ninja would quite literally appear to disappear in a puff of smoke. But the mysterious Bansen Shukai blueprints hold even more surprises for scholars of the ninja, who were renowned for stealth and silence. For the development of ninja explosives did not stop at the shuriken bomb. The ninja also used gunpowder to cause surprise and confusion. So we know from the manuals that some of these um, bamboo devices were used singly, like the grenades, but they also speak of multiple ones. So these might have been full-size ones, or they might actually have been uh, smaller ones, which were used more not to cause damage, but to cause disruption. And uh, this is a sort of multi-charge device, and these would have been fused together so they wouldn't all go off simultaneously. So it'd be a bit like a sort of cracker jack. So throw a few of these into a room, and it would be a surprise tactic. There could be a small group of people, perhaps four or five people, lobbing a whole load of these, and it would be like being attacked by maybe 20 or 30 or 50. Others had serious potential as anti-personnel weapons, comparable to modern hand grenades. Now, when you cut bamboo, it's got what is called these nodes, and they're actually like little sealed compartments. We can just see that one sealed there. And if you just cut them either side of the node, we get a completely sealed tube, which is quite effective. Um, I've drilled a hole in these to fill them with, to put the gunpowder in, then a little plug which would be glued in with some sort of a, a resin adhesive, and then we put the fuse through the little hole in the top. Light the fuse, lob this thing, and you've got a, quite an effective grenade. We're trying to simulate um, one of these grenades going off just as it's passing someone's body. This would be coming through the air at a fair, a fair speed. And we've placed this dummy here so that we can get some idea of how much um, damage this thing would do to the human body. That was a real surprise. I never expected these things to go off like that. It was a huge bang. We've got bits of bamboo actually impaled into the dummy. We can see areas of charring here, all from a simple little device with a few ounces of gunpowder. But the most surprising use of explosives from the ninja, who were famous for stealth and silence, involved an attack that literally blew the earth apart. The target of one assassination attempt was the Lord Isayagu, who had made a great many enemies through his underhand political dealings. Selecting a road they knew he would be traveling, the ninja planted a deadly trap. They dug beneath the road and planted uh, bombs, effectively, and uh, to, to ambush his party and to try and assassinate him. From the devices detailed in the Bansen Shukai, only one is able to contain enough gunpowder to create this kind of large-scale destruction. The book describes the Uzumebi, a wooden box filled with explosives. The problem is if they're just nailed together, which they probably would have been, when the gunpowder explodes, these are going to blow apart quite easily. And to some extent, this will lessen the impact of the explosives. The explosive power of gunpowder increases the more it is constrained. One of the simplest methods of constraining them a bit more would be to bind them with rope. But could these incredibly simple devices really create enough force to collapse the foundations of a road? What we really need to do is explode a few of these things and um, just get a rough idea of whether they do the kind of damage that is commensurate with the damage that was done in the, um, in the tail. Using materials similar to that of the soft earthen roads of ancient Japan, we are going to test how powerful these Uzumebi bombs really are. The fuse would have been a black powder fuse lit from a hiding place some distance away. Well, I think that was pretty significant. That was a fairly small device, about a pound, a pound and a quarter of gunpowder. It's completely demolished this pile of, uh, of earth here. We imagine those three or four times that size, sapped under a road. That's the end of the road, and whatever happens to be walking on the road. And it's also a, a really surprisingly loud crash. The destruction caused by the bombs in our tests shows that, in fact, they are able to cause a serious explosion and substantial displacement of the Earth, going as deep as 20 feet. 
It was a great explosion. It worked technically fantastically. A big hole in the old, much death and destruction. The great warlord Isayagu was killed. As was characteristic of the ninja, they would have attacked unannounced and undetected. This covert tactic, coupled with their explosives knowledge, would have been a terrifying and deadly combination. A true demonstration of the skill and resourcefulness of ancient Japan's secret agent. But 1,000 years before the ninja, a Roman secret agent went undercover to save the entire city of Rome. How did he swim against a river torrent wearing a solid metal suit of armor, yet still float? In 390 BC, Rome was under siege by 70,000 marauding Gauls. When the Gauls took over Rome, they didn't just take over the city, they destroyed it. Besieged on the Capitoline Hill, senators had to watch as Rome's history burnt to the ground. The survival of the city rested in the hands of one man, a secret agent who swam 130 feet across the River Tiber in a suit of armor. How did he do it? And why didn't he sink? It's a mystery 24 centuries old. Rome in 390 BC was a tenuous place to be, where power shifted from day to day. The Gauls surrounded the city and trapped Rome's senators on Capitoline Hill. Rome's only hope was an army stationed 17 miles away, commanded by General Camillus. Roman tradition and law forbade generals from leading their armies into the city. Even in this time of crisis, Camillus needed the permission of the Senate to assume temporary dictatorship and march on Rome. Camillus had to get a message through to the senators. He needed to get their approval for him to be made dictator and general so that he could lead the forces to victory and regain Rome. How did he do this? He chose one man, the first kind of hero of the ancient Roman story, to take that message for him. Ancient source documents written by Roman historian Plutarch record that the agent's name was Gaius Pontius. Very little is known about this hero of Roman history, except that it was he who was tasked with the challenge of getting the message into Rome. Gaius faced a problem. How did he cross the fast-flowing river Tiber while still wearing some kind of protective armor so that he could fight his way through to the Senate if necessary? Plutarch states that the ancient secret agent invented the world's first floating suit of armor. And he half swims, half floats across the river, and then climbs up at night and manages to make contact with some of the key Roman leaders. And he says to them, listen, there's this man that you exiled called Camillus. He's exactly the man that we need to come back and defend us at this time of great crisis. But how do you make a suit of armor that floats? Plutarch wrote that Pontius had crafted a suit of armor made of metal and cork. At the Royal Lifeboat College in England, Ancient Discoveries is applying the latest scientific techniques to the story of Gaius and the cork suit that saved Rome. What we're doing today is trying to experiment and trying to demonstrate how a suit of corks would work. Dan Shadrake is an expert in Roman equipment and espionage activities. He is investigating how to make a cork buoyancy aid just like the one Gaius Pontius used to swim across the River Tiber. You would take strips of this bark, cork bark, and basically, as you can see here, cut them down, cut off strips of cork, and just basically push them into the cells of the, of the under armor garment. Dan's design reveals that the Romans may have invented history's first life jacket. When I look at the materials, when I look at, look at the principles involved, i.e. you're essentially making a life preserver around, around the upper body, as it were, it does look incredibly like a modern life jacket. It's fairly surprising that somebody should come up with the concept of a life jacket at least 1,900 years before, before we actually knew that life jackets existed. Now Dan needs to find out if the Roman's secret life jacket actually works. If I go straight to the bottom, <laughs> then obviously I'm wrong. The tank is calibrated to simulate rough water conditions similar to those Gaius Pontius would have faced at night when crossing the River Tiber.
Amazingly, Dan floats comfortably. I'm still retaining my buoyancy. So far, I'm feeling fairly relaxed. I don't know how I feel wearing bronze armor on top of this, but as I say, it's keeping me afloat. The ancient Roman cork suit passes the test with distinction, but Plutarch tells us that Gaius used the cork suit to support him while wearing full-scale armor on his hazardous swim. Will the cork layer also support this extra 25 pounds of weight? It is incredibly heavy. These tiny bronze scales are sewn onto a backing of leather, so I'm going to be testing the buoyancy of this cork suit and my swimming skills, which aren't very good, to the absolute limit. If Gaius had encountered gall resistance, the plate armor would have allowed him to fight his way out, but it weighs 25 pounds. Can the cork suit keep a secret agent buoyant even when he is wearing solid bronze armor? I may well go straight to the bottom in this stuff, but I'm very, very glad that lifeguards are standing by. The Lifeboat College training team fit Dan with a safety line in case the experiment goes wrong. I don't believe this, I'm actually buoyant. No, I'm still being kept afloat. I'm having to work at it a lot more. The buoyancy of the cork acts against the force of gravity, which is trying to pull the metal armor under the water. The structure of cork contains lots of pockets. These fill with air, and although some air escapes when the cork is put in water, enough remains to make the wood extremely wow. buoyant. I was amazed that I had any sort of buoyancy at all. It was a massive effort to keep afloat, but if I hadn't had the cork flotation device, I'm pretty sure I would have gone straight to the bottom. This is a heck of a weight. Gaius Pontius was able to swim undetected across the River Tiber in his full armor and to deliver his message. The senators knew they had no choice. They made Camillus dictator of Rome. Now Camillus could bring troops into the city without breaking the law. When Camillus came back and took control of Rome, threw the Gauls out, thanks to the help he gained from Gaius Pontius and perhaps the court buoyancy aid, he was called a second Romulus, a second founder of Rome, and Rome, from that period on, only gathered in strength. Sometimes a message must be sent without a secret agent to carry it personally. The ways in which the ancients delivered secret messages were extraordinary. Amazingly, there is evidence that they wrote some on the inside of eggs. Working undercover, deep behind enemy lines, the secret agent is called upon to infiltrate, sabotage, and even assassinate for his country. But by far, the most important and valued asset the secret agent produces is information, intelligence. Getting the intelligence home can be as dangerous and difficult a task as any the secret agent must perform. Counterintelligence agencies try to intercept communications, the answer for the secret agent is steganography. Steganography is the art or science of secret writing. It was often associated with mysticism and the occult uh, in the medieval and renaissance period. The point was to send secret messages between diplomats based on secret, personal, private texts that the rest of the world couldn't read. A mysterious and little known figure from the ancient world can rightly be thought of as the father of steganography. His work is the basis for many top secret communications even today. His name was Giovanni Porta. Giovanni Porta was one of those amazing characters in history that had an insatiable curiosity and will to acquire knowledge on all and every subject available to him. He was born in 1535 in Naples and he was born into a very wealthy family so he had a superb education, the best that was available at the time. But Porta lived under the shadow of the Spanish Inquisition, a 356-year campaign against Jews, Protestants, and explorers of what the Catholic Church defined as heresy. Porta and several like-minded fellows founded a, an academy, a, it was called the Academia dei Secreti in, in Italian, um, which was a, an organization um, a group of people, like-minded people, that wanted to delve into 
how nature worked. As it was uh, later famously said, the Bible tells you how to get to the heavens, but uh, not how the heavens themselves move. Thus, De La Porta found himself um, at times in direct confrontation with the church. The Spanish Inquisition left an estimated 135,000 dead over four centuries. Giovanni Porta needed secrecy to survive. Under the Inquisition, thousands of people were imprisoned, and the prison authorities were absolutely meticulous about checking everyone that visited the prison. It's even reported that people would try and write messages um, inside their fingers, and even these were checked. So one thing that wasn't actually checked under the Inquisition rules were eggs, and it was just assumed that these were harmless. There is no way that um, they could be used either for sec secreting objects or messages of any sort. And of course, someone eventually found a way around this. In chapter 17 of his book, Magica Naturalis, he details how to write a secret message on the inside of an egg. He describes a process by which you write with a special mixture on the outside of the egg. The message disappears, and then once the recipient receives the egg, he's able to open the egg, and the message is there again visible for him to read. Leading model maker Richard Windley is investigating the accounts of Porta and the secret eggs. In the saucepan here, I've got um, some natural plant pigment, and what we're going to do is to add some vinegar and some alum. Alum is a naturally occurring class of minerals used since ancient times for a range of purposes. One of its useful properties is in dyeing, where it helps the plant pigment color the eggshell. Richard is using exactly the same mixture to write the magic ink as Porta himself would have used over 500 years ago. We've got that in there. We're going to give that a good mix around now and gradually heat it up until everything is um, dissolved. Richard marks the egg with a sign, the letter X. He must let the ink dry for 20 minutes before immersing it in water for an additional five minutes. What we need to do now is to leave this for a while, so what we want is for the, the acid and the alum and the pigment to actually be absorbed through the eggshell, which is sort of semi-porous. The egg is then boiled, washing away the ink. The acids in the ink seep through the eggshell to the inside, leaving no visible trace. This isn't a resounding success, but I think at least we've proved that this process is actually possible. And certainly this would be a feasible method of, um, of actually relaying secret information from one person to another. The test unveils that Porta's secret writing was able to penetrate state security through the most simple of objects. But what would the ancients do to write longer messages? They needed a way of making the ink itself invisible. Ancient texts left by the Roman poet Ovid record the use of invisible ink. One of the first examples we get from the ancient world of the use of invisible ink is not to do with military warfare. It's not even to do with political intelligence gathering. It's to do with the art of making love. Ovid, that great poet in his Ars Amatoria, The Art of Love, tells about the ways that you can get a message to your secret lover, particularly when she's a married woman. Ancient texts describe the use of milk, vinegar, and honey as invisible inks. Richard Windley is investigating. Richard is using milk to write the word classified onto the paper. In ancient times, they would have left the message underneath a candle or a fire, but Richard is using a low intensity light to dry the paper and reveal the message. The ink works because when certain natural substances heat up, they change color, just the way meat does in a frying pan. Right, well, this is the, uh, the actual sample um, word I wrote. And um, a fairly modest amount of heat has, has actually developed it actually uh, unbelievably well. Um, there's a few places where the, the, the paper was at the point of scorching before it, the, the words actually developed, but the rest of the paper is fine. We've, um, we haven't had to get anywhere near the, the charring temperature of the paper for this thing to actually develop. I mean, that is really surprising. Um, 
maybe we tend to be a bit sceptical about some of these texts that we read, um, even, even as late as 20th century texts, but it just seems rather far-fetched. But, you know, it's, um, it's worked, it's, and it's worked really well. Ancient secret agents weren't just trained to write on the inside of eggs, they were also trained to kill. Sometimes the weapon they used was as simple as a knife, but at others, it was as complex as a clockwork-operated bomb. Covert assassination attempts have been carried out since the beginning of history. Secret agents ordered to eliminate the enemy target and leave no trace behind. One of the most complex weapons ever designed to do this was the time bomb used throughout modern history to take out men too well protected to be killed by conventional means. In 1955, Chinese and CIA secret agents placed a time bomb on a light aeroplane in an attempt to assassinate the Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai. At 9.25 Greenwich Mean Time, the bomb exploded, sending the burning aircraft crashing into the sea. The agents who planned the attack might have been surprised to discover that they were following in the footsteps of secret agents over 400 years ago. Hidden in a mysterious ancient text from the 16th century lies a description of what could be the world's first time bomb. We have a number of early texts from um, the 16th century onwards. And at that time, people were experimenting with pyrotechnics. Um, Gunpowder was a relatively uh, new kind of development. It had been around for a while, but people were finding new ways of using it and developing it and finding out its full potential. And there are often in manuscripts this sort of talk about trying to set off a bomb with a clock. One such manuscript is a military manual written by the Austrian military engineer and bomb designer Wolf von Senfenberg. Ancient discoveries expert Richard Windley is finding out how such a weapon was constructed and whether it would have worked. We've just got these tantalizing references in the text to, to time bombs. So really my job here was to think, how can we actually build an effective working time bomb given the technology of the time? The first thing they'd have needed was the timer. A time bomb, by definition, requires some sort of time delay system. And uh, what I've got here is, is my kind of reconstruction of one of the very earliest of the mechanical timing devices. In essence, it's basically the, uh, the escapement of a very, very early clock. Mechanical clocks started to appear in the 13th century. The first clocks that that came into being tended to be public clocks. These would be on, uh, on towers and um, would strike the hours. They, they didn't have faces, they didn't tell the time with hands as we're familiar with now. They simply worked by striking bells. Known as alarums, these early monastical clocks were used to ring the bells for religious services. They worked through a system of weights and wheels. To put it in its most simple terms, we've got the gravitational force acting on the weight, which is turning this wheel here. And that is imparting just enough energy to the folio, this bit at the top, to make it go backwards and forwards. But the folio is in turn stopping that wheel and allowing just one tooth at a time. The clock runs for as long as it takes the weight to fall, a beautiful and intricate piece of ancient engineering. But Richard thinks he's found a way to adapt the alarm system of this clock, turning what was an innocent religious timepiece into a potentially deadly weapon. On the monastic alarm, this would ring a bell. But if we want to set up some other sort of device, um, particularly if we're talking about a time bomb, we can simply modify this lever, and I've got a little rod here coming off this lever, and all we need to do is attach that to some ignition system. For an ignition system, Richard decides to use the wheel lock, a revolutionary gadget that appeared in the 16th century. The way it works, basically, um, is that there's a little wheel which has got serrations on it, and uh, inside the lock is a strong spring which rotates the wheel. Resting against the wheel is a piece of iron pyrite held in a clamp. When the trigger's pulled, we pull that, that little wheel whips around very, very sharply, about three quarters of a turn, as I say, and the friction um, between the serrations and the pyrite causes a little shower of sparks, and those sparks are enough to light the priming powder. An ideal component for a time bomb. The beauty of the wheel lock is the fact it's small, it can be set or cocked. 
and it will just sit there until that trigger is pulled. Perfect for a secret agent whose target is powerful and well protected. If the assailant can get access to where that person is going to be at a set time, he can set this all up, he can make his getaway. But will it work? With his ignition system in place, Richard decides it is time to test his device. We've got the timer tripping out a bit like an alarm clock. That triggers the wheel lock. The wheel lock triggers the fuse. The fuse triggers the gunpowder. By altering the position of a small brass pin on the front wheel of the clock, Richard can change the time the bomb goes off. If the little pin was, say, here when we start the clock, it's got to make an entire revolution before it trips this little thing. Richard calibrates the bomb, timing the revolutions of the wheel so he can know when to set the pin. The whole trick with a device like this is A, making sure that we get ignition, but also the timing period is fairly critical. These things are very, very rare, these virgin folio clocks, and because I've made this from scratch, it's very, very difficult to know exactly how long it's going to run for. We've set it for about a minute. I'm going to start the clock now, and we'll see if it actually works. As the seconds tick away, the pin approaches the lever, which will trigger the bomb. The mechanism is a success, and the fuse is lit. It all worked exactly as we, we'd hoped it would. Um, we timed the clock. The clock was in um, within a few seconds of what we predicted. And um, just for a brief second, I thought the um, primer wasn't going to go in the wheel lock. But there was a very slight delay, and then the primer burned. This test has proved the principle. The earliest designed time bomb could have worked. And with further adjustments, the bomb could be set with a longer delay giving more time before activating the device and the explosion. By interposing another chain of gears in there, we could make this run for uh, about 30 times longer than, than, than this is actually doing, so we could easily get hours out of this. Had the barrel been full of gunpowder, the whole building would have been reduced to a pile of rubble. It would be most useful situated in a cellar or under a great hall so that the whole thing would collapse. It would be very difficult to get this in very, very close proximity to the target because the noise would be heard. Um, but if it could be sort of secreted away behind drapes or, as I say, underground or underneath the floor of a room, then um, there's no reason it shouldn't work. But although it's likely the bomb would have gone off, it's uncertain whether it would have killed its target. When the CIA planted its bomb on the Chinese premier's plane in 1955, the assassination attempt failed because he never boarded the flight. The reality with all time bombs, whether ancient or modern, is the ability to ensure that the victim is in the right place at the right time. Based on the tactics of Alexander the Great, Ancient Discoveries has set a four-mile race between three ancient communication techniques. Carrier pigeon, horse, and fire beacon. Which would you bet on? Whatever mission the ancient secret agent chose to accept, his work would be hampered without a system that unites spy networks everywhere and across time getting the message home. Secret agents rely on complex communication systems to deliver priceless data back to base. The ancient world was no different. This is a world without internet, without telephones, without TV, without text messaging, without satellites. This is a world where you have to invest huge resources, huge manpower into creating a network through which you can send information, and through which you can establish authority. No one understood this better than Alexander the Great, the most successful military commander in history. A man undefeated in battle who conquered over two million square miles of land, all by the time he was 30. In a short space of time, only 13 years, he created an empire bigger than the world had ever seen. In order to create and then control it, Alexander needed an intelligence network as strong as his army. If his secret agents couldn't get intelligence back quickly, it would be out of date. And it was through this gathering of information that the armies were able to position themselves, were able to engage and find the enemy in such a vast country, and most importantly, to outwit them in tactics. 
three principal message sending techniques were deployed. The carrier pigeon, the horse, and networks of fire beacons. But for over 2,000 years, historians have puzzled over a baffling question. Which was the quickest? To find out, Ancient Discoveries is launching a giant communications race. Over four miles of coast, each of our three competitors will race to successfully deliver a secret message. What we're doing today is an experiment, and it's a real valuable archaeological experiment, because we have all these ancient sources that tell us these things work. We've done experiments to a degree elsewhere that show that they do work. We've never managed to compare them. Each competitor will have exactly the same equipment and instruments as the ancients would have had over 2,400 years ago. The most common form of transport in the ancient world was the horse. Horse messengers were a critical part of Alexander's communication system. He developed a sophisticated horse relay network across his empire, with each station positioned a day's ride apart. Standing in the way of the horse's victory is the ancient world's stealth plane, the carrier pigeon used since Egyptian times to carry messages over difficult terrain. To monitor the progress of the bird, pigeon scientist Tim Guilford is attaching a GPS tracking device to the pigeon's wing. This is one of our latest miniature GPS logging devices. It has a receiver chip in the center here, and this looks for, listens to, if you like, a constellation of orbiting satellites around the Earth. And when it picks up three or more of these satellites, it can, using essentially radio waves, triangulate its position anywhere on the globe. Our final competitor is the most advanced form of ancient communication system, a 2,000-year-old form of Morse code, a technology that sent messages encoded by fire unlimited distances. Fire relay systems were very fast, flame to flame. You see the flame, you light yours, it moves on. But a giant flaming beacon isn't very covert. To send a message that the enemy can't read, the ancients needed a secret code. In this case, our beacon operators will be using the Polybius code, in which different combinations of torches signal different letters. For example, four torches on the left and five on the right equals the letter Y. With beacon stations positioned across the empire, the ancients were able to send messages extraordinary distances. If you just uh, have one after another in a relay system, you have basically unlimited range. The burning ends of the poles are coated with pitch and tar. Once alight, these are very hard to put out and would continue to burn in strong wind or even rain. Will the race prove fire signaling was faster than bird, beast, or man? Using satellite data, computer scientist James Dean has 3D mapped the race landscape. Let's take a look at the course that the race is going to be following. And if we add some elevation data here, the stations are going to be laid out. So we have a start station here, and the distances are about two thirds of a mile, a mile, a mile, and a mile. James has also compiled detailed location data sets, mapping the obstacles the other competitors will be facing. The horse is going to be following a bridle path, which goes along the coast here. And we can see that there's a few hills along the way and some gates, and that's really going to slow the horse down. If we look here, we can see today, these are the wind currents fluctuating slightly, so that's going to be a factor on the, the speed that the pigeon can maintain. And what we're going to be able to do is collect the GPS data from the, the tracker on the pigeon. And once we've got that, we can see when it's covered the same distance as the rest of the participants, and we'll see who crosses the virtual finish line first. Begin the race in five, four, three, two, one. Please give the message. The race is on, and the message is given to each competitor. The pigeon leaps into the air, the clear quick starter. On its back, it carries a GPS chip. This will send a signal to an array of satellites across the northern hemisphere, tracking its every position. Not sure that's homeward, though. Whilst we're waiting for the GPS data to come back from the pigeon, we can be following the progress of the horse versus the fire signal. And it'll be interesting to see how four legs compare to the A-frames, which will be sending their signal via light, which will be traveling at about 186,000 miles per second. 
The horse won't be going nearly that fast. At a steady canter, a horse can travel at around 15 miles per hour. But the beacons are taking time to transmit each letter of the message. Three, one. After one mile and 10 minutes, the horse approaches beacon station two. And as we get to the second station here, we can see that the horse and the signal are neck and neck at the moment. The signal has been received at the second station and is about to be transmitted onto the second one as the horse goes by. At station three, a weakness in the ancient fire beacon system becomes clear. Four, two. This is interesting. Three, two. We're now at 15 minutes and 30 seconds, and we can see that the horse is now passing the fourth station. And if we look at the fire signals, it looks like the A-frames are having some sort of difficulty. The message is still caught up between the third and fourth stations at the moment. It's difficult to tell from this data, but they're spending a lot longer on this leg than they have on the previous ones. Five, oh dear. two. Oh, dear, that doesn't sound good. The inexperienced operators are having trouble deciphering the signals. Five, five. We're now at 20 minutes, and we can see that the A-frames are now starting to send the message. And if we look at the progress of the horse, we can see that it's starting to tire. Its average speed has dropped to nine miles per hour. So there's still everything to play for. It's almost the word. <laughs> On three. After 20 minutes, the message has traveled three miles. We're now at 22 minutes, and we can see that the horse is rapidly approaching the finish line. And if we look at the A-frames, we can see that they're, they're still signaling. It looks like they've got about 20 characters to go. So. It looks like the horse has got it. The horse crosses the finishing line as the final letters are being read from the last beacon. It appears to be a close win for the horse. But how did the pigeon compare? The pigeon has flown back to its home roost and not to the finishing line. In the ancient world, pigeon lofts would have been set up along a direct route between secret agent and high command. For this experiment, James must overlay the path of the pigeon over the course of the race. Now we've got the GPS data back from the pigeon, let's overlay it on the map and see what it looks like. Now it's actually heading for its loft over in this direction, so if we translate that path back again here, so it's following the same line as the other competitors, we can see how it compares. And as we see the pigeon cross the finish line here, time's now at 6 minutes 20. That gives it an average speed of 32 miles per hour, three times faster than the horse. That's a clear win for the pigeon. The pigeon finished the four-mile course in an incredible six minutes, 38 seconds. The pigeon beat us by six minutes, the horse by four. Not only have the beacons been thrashed by the horse and pigeon, but their message has become undecipherable. Which reads, there's Mojin Jumble, tomorrow hands was. <laughs> <Bang on. laughs> so I think it's back to the drawing board just for the moment. So why did the message system that works at the speed of light fail? We were still at the stage of looking up the code table for every single letter. If we'd have been able to do it like a professional army would have done it, they would have done it almost by instinct. They must have been very, very well trained, much, much better than we've been able to do in the day. But in spite of the fact that the pigeon won the race, there are drawbacks to using the bird. They only work in one direction. The pigeon must be smuggled behind enemy lines in order to carry its message back home again. While the horse can carry messages in both directions, it is also susceptible to attack by enemy troops. Although the fire beacons came in last, the test reveals an important fact. Moving at the speed of light, it was not the technology that let them down. It was the operators. The results of our great intelligence race reveal a profound insight into the way secret agents and covert operatives worked in the ancient world, one that affects the lives of field agents today. No matter how good the system or the technology, it is the training, skill, and bravery of the secret agents themselves that ultimately turned the tide of war. From fast and accurate signalers sending secret coded messages home, to the bravery of men like Gaius Pontius who swam the river Tiber in floating armor, or the ingenuity of men who created secret inks or fashioned bombs out of simple materials. Then, as now, intelligence services and commanders alike rely on the human link in the chain.
The ancient world was shaped by technological advances, but created by the genius and bravery of human secret agents.